it's important to understand that there are many uh, ingredients and there are many factors that influence motivation. The idea that we can uh, make a list and only what's on the list counts and everything that's on the list counts is, you know, is, is a bit naive. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. In this episode, I talk to award-winning psychologist Ayelet Fischbach about the exciting science of motivation. How do we motivate ourselves to do anything? From her extensive research, Ayelet shares with us four crucial strategies for successful behavior change. First, identify the right goals. Second, avoid what she calls the middle. Third, resist temptations. And fourth, seek social support. And equally important, Ayot gives tips on how to sustain motivation for longer periods of time. We also touch on the topics of reinforcement, flow, deliberate practice, self-control, and of course, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So without further ado, I bring you Ayelet Fischbach. Nice to finally meet you. I, I we have uh, you know we have colleagues, in you know Angela Duckworth and others that uh, that love you and. Oh. Um, it's nice to finally meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Same, yeah. same here. So you're a leader in the field of motivation science, um, is what you how you refer to in the book. Can you kind of tell our listeners a little bit about the you know kind of trace the history of the field of motivation science and who are, who are some of the original key players in the field and uh, and uh, yeah, let's start there. Sort of the tell people what motivation science uh, is. Motivation science is the uh, the study of uh, motivation. As we can infer from the name, uh, we look at uh, uh, what gets people out of bed in the morning and into uh, achieving their their goals, be it their uh, professional goals, their health goals, their academic goals, uh, um, how you motivate others, uh, how you motivate yourself, which is uh, specifically uh, uh, interesting uh, for me. And, and so on. Okay? Uh, we are interested in this internal power that we call motivation that gets people going. Uh, you asked about people. There are so many. So we, we briefly uh, chatted about uh, our mutual friend, uh, Angela Duckworth. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. And, you know, I, I work with, with hair uh, a lot. There, there are just so uh, many. Uh, I work with uh, uh, Katie Milkman. Uh, 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 my uh, uh, advisors, Yakov uh, uh, Chorp and Ari Koblansky did amazing work on uh, motivation. Uh, people like uh, Walter Michel and, and Tori Higgins and uh, there was such a long list. I, I will. I'll stop there because there's just uh, so many people. It's an exploding field. Yeah, it is an exploding field. Would you consider Abraham Maslow as part of uh, the origin story of the field? Oh yeah, yes. That uh, well, and you know, you can go all the way to Kurt Lewin and uh, you know people that mm-hmm. <laughs> inspired our uh, thinking. Uh, uh, or William James, even. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so if we, uh, uh, you know, go back to the, the origins, what I think was very important about Maslow's uh, work was identifying that people have different motivations so that, that it's not just about uh, uh what he referred to as, as basic needs. I am less convinced by the hierarchy there. I revised the hierarchy actually recently, so I'll send you that work. <laughs> Maybe I can see what you think about my revision <laughs> of it. <laughs> and, please, yeah. please do. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, Tell me more about your your uh, your criticism of the hierarchy. Uh, so the uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy assumes that uh, needs are always fulfilled in in, in a certain uh, order, and so you you, mm. you would need uh, food before you would need uh, safety, uh, for example, which I don't think is justifiable by any uh, uh, modern research, uh, uh, feeling safe is uh, as basic as, uh, as feeling that you you meet your, your basic uh, uh, other needs. Uh, and in, in no more, uh, the, the more central criticism is that 
for uh, many of us who are sufficiently comfortable to have uh, uh, enough uh, uh, food and, and, and safety and like we, we have a roof over our head, what's missing in a given moment is not in particular uh, order, okay? It, it's not that we first make sure that uh, our uh, job uh, gets us money before we uh, want to see if it's also interesting to do that, okay? Uh, it's really individual. It's very they get, uh, different for different people in different situations. And in my thinking, it's often more... Uh, use, useful to think about what's missing. Okay, what's missing from your job? What's missing from your life? What's missing from your uh, exercise uh, uh, regimen? And, and and not in a particular order. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think a lot of people misrepresented what he actually wrote because he tried to make it clear that it didn't all happen in a particular order that was necessary. And also, he never even drew a pyramid, and that was misrepresented uh, by. People were trying to come up with psych textbooks, trying to illustrate it incorrectly. So yeah, no, I completely agree, and I'm, I'm glad that you made that point for sure. So now you're a professor at the business school, right, yes. at the University of Chicago. So why did you choose a business school over like a psychology department, just out of curiosity? Oh, I did not choose a business school over a psychology oh. <laughs> department. A business school chose me. Okay? I applied Fair for uh, 10 jobs, uh, nine were in uh, psychology departments <laughs> and one was in a business school. And uh, oh, yeah, that's where I got my first job 20 years later. It pays better. pays better. <laughs> Business schools. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I uh, uh, didn't know that at the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's great. Um, you know that there's such great synergy between the work being done in business schools, right? I mean, the, in psychology departments all around the world, right? There's there's a lot of people collaborating and trying to understand what motivates us at work, but also what motivates us to you know out of work as well. You know, and the whole the whole thing. So you yeah. uh, you outlined four essential ingredients in successful behavior change in your book. And I'd like to just, if that's cool with you, can we go through each one today and talk about the latest motivation science for people? So the first, the first ingredient is choosing a goal. And you argue that it's, it's powerful uh, that you argue that's important to pick a goal that's powerful and specific enough, but not too specific to get you to the finish line. So this is my question. Why is setting goals harder than it seems at first? I would ask myself, or I would ask you, is this goal something that brings to mind actions? Can you relate it to something that you are going to, to do? Uh, is uh, is this a positive uh, state, or is this like an, an, an end state? Is this a goal as opposed to a, a means or, or a chore? Okay, uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, I give the example of. Uh, uh, setting a goal to apply for a job. You actually know what that means when people say, I want to apply for for a job. They can easily translate it into action. Uh, But it's not very inspiring because it's not really what you want to do. You want to have a job. Okay, You want to maybe have a career. And and so setting the goal in terms of what you're trying to achieve, not in terms of how would you do this, uh, is a better... Uh, setting a goal that is intrinsic is very uh, unintuitive to, to people. Uh, in a way, often we think about setting goal in, in terms of I'm going to force myself to do the thing that I don't want to do. Uh, but you know what? If I cannot find any immediate rewards in doing this uh, goal, if, if it doesn't feel right to me, if there's no intrinsic motivation, then this goal is is going to fail. And I will just mention one more thing. Many times we set do not goals, avoidance uh, goals, and uh, uh, those uh, uh, tend to be uh, not so great. Yeah. What does it mean to set an avoidance goal? What does that mean exactly? Uh, it, the goal is not to do something? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so we, we ask uh, uh, thousands of people about their New Year's resolutions. It's uh, uh, something that we started a few years ago. <laughs> and uh, many people set a goal of uh, uh, not not to do something, not to uh, uh, eat something, uh, uh, not to spend on something, and uh, not to uh, be in a relationship with uh, uh, certain uh, people. And the problem with avoidance goals, which, by the way, they 
they seem urgent. So, so this is good. Like when you say I should not do something, that seems more urgent than I should do something. But the problem is that do not goals or avoidance goals tend to bring to mind the thing that you are trying not to do. And uh, you know, if we go all the way back to like uh, uh, Wagner's uh, studies with uh, uh, asking people not to think about white bears, okay, if I ask you not to think about white bears, you are thinking about white bears. If I ask you not to uh, think about your, your ex or uh, food uh, that uh, you should not eat, well, you are now thinking about that person or uh, the, uh, the food. And so that... These avoidance goals tend to bring to mind the thing that you are trying to avoid, and they are just less intrinsically motivating. Hmm. I, I I did like the idea I heard once of not only having a to do list but having a not to do list. That can be helpful, right? Um, as long as it's you're just not obsessing over what's on the not to do list and constantly thinking about that. Can't can't a not to do list be helpful? Uh, yes. Uh, avoidance uh, goals are uh, useful in the sense that they seem urgent and that certain people just have the personality orientation of being more of avoiders than uh, uh, than approachers. So they, they are just more attracted toward the uh, do not uh, 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 lists. Uh, uh, Saying that, uh, uh, if you are uh, unsure, uh, go with the approach, go with the do uh, goals they on average, tend to work better. Hey everyone, I'm excited to announce that the eight week online transcend course is back. Become certified in learning the latest science of human potential and learn how to live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self actualized life. The course starts on March 13th and will include more than 10 hours of recorded lectures, four live group Q&A sessions with me, four small group sessions with our world-class faculty, a plethora of resources and articles to support your learning, and an exclusive workbook of growth challenges that will help you overcome your deepest fears and grow as a whole person. There are even some personalized self-actualization coaching spots with me available as an add-on. Save your spot today and get 50% off the normal price by going to transcendcourse.com. Sign up for the early bird today and get 50% off at transcendcourse.com. We have so much fun in this course, and I look forward to welcoming you to be a part of the Transcender community. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah, um, so here's a Maslow quote I love. What's not worth doing is not worth doing well. And that sounds yeah. <laughs> it summarizes a lot of what, what you're saying there, which is great. Um, yeah, one of the chapters you wrote uh, is actually called "Goals Aren't Chores," right? Mm -hmm. And that's to to highlight the fact that intrinsic motivation matters, and um, you know, where we our goals should light us up, right? At some point, <laughs> they should inspire us, energize us. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I give some yeah. examples of how much we hate paying for shipping or, or parking. Um, or a, a gift wrapping or, or anything that's uh, uh, not the thing itself. Like we would not like to invest our money in it. We also would not like to invest effort. Okay? We, when we ask people about how motivated they are to study for some uh, uh, class that is required in order to take another class, okay? the prerequisite, they are not very uh, motivated. I, I discovered one of uh, uh, the studies that we ran in which we auctioned a book and some people mm -hmm. were uh, bidding on the book. It was a signed book by my colleague here, uh, Richard Thaler. Uh, other people were bidding on a tote bag that contained the book. Now, they knew that the book was in the tote bag, okay, that like, we met them, we, we presented this to them. And nevertheless, uh, uh, the bidding on the book was about, uh, on average, $23. And uh, on the uh, tote bag that contained the book, uh, only uh, around uh, $12. So no, uh, e even though people got more, they were willing to pay less because we don't like to invest in means. I mean, it's such a profound point that I feel like is often lost in the workplace a lot when managers try to motivate their employees. Uh, yes, we often uh, mm. too much in uh, uh, the the details. We forget the the big picture. We are uh, you know, uh, uh, trying yeah. to motivate ourselves to complete a task. Not sure why we even do that. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, so let's stick. Let, let, let's let's continue down this train of thought about the importance of uh, choosing the right goals and um, and and for the goal setting process. You also argue it's it's nice to kind of put a number on it, right? And so, what's the role of quantification in in this process? These numbers tend to be highly uh, motivating. Uh, people tend to think about. Uh, Achieving anything that is below the number is, uh, is a loss, as if they did not achieve the goal. So, you know, if I set my goal as uh, walking 10,000 steps a day, which is kind of a random goal that some marketer invented, okay, right. but it, it's really this, like, just a number. Okay, uh, But if this is my goal and I only uh, walk 9,900 uh, steps, I might find myself uh, mm-hmm. stepping around my uh, bedroom just to uh, to reach the daily goal, okay, to uh, to mm-hmm. feel that I achieved it. These numbers are highly uh, motivating. Another a nice example comes from a study that looked at the distribution of uh, marathon running times. Turn out that there are many more people who finish a marathon just below four hours, so three hours and 59 minutes, than just above <laughs> four hours, like four hours and one minute. Uh-huh. And this, this is kind of cool because really, like, what motivated them to put the energy in the last uh, a few uh, uh, minutes was that they are going to meet their goal of getting it after uh, four minutes. Uh, four that hours. Is so four hours. <laughs> Yeah, four hours. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that that is so interesting. Uh, so, kind of keeping that uh, count and 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 where you're, you know, how close you are to getting there on a consistent basis. Like, I assume that's something you can get obsessed with as well, though, right? And that can start to distract, like anything, you know, inverted U shaped curve in psychology. Everything's everything's a U shaped inverted U shaped curve, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. so sometimes the targets are meaningful okay for uh, some goals uh, it's really uh, all or nothing okay uh, unless you mm-hmm. graduate the very last uh, uh, class in in you know, uh, in your degree you're not getting a degree okay uh, mm-hmm. unless you have made all the purchases toward the reward you are not getting the the reward okay so for for some goals it, it really is the case that you need to get to the target, otherwise you're not getting uh, anything completed. Uh, but for all these other uh, goals, such as uh, exercising or uh, uh, you know, developing professionally, uh, mm. you should just have healthy relationships with uh, these target numbers. They are meant to motivate you. They, they are not that important. It really doesn't matter if you almost got to this number or, or not. Mm. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Um, and how do incentives play a role here? Um, I, I guess that's intertwined with the extrinsic versus intrinsic reward distinction in psychology. But how else does how else does do incentives matter? Y- yes and no. Yeah. Uh, we used to think that incentives undermine intrinsic motivation. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't really think that anymore. There is really a no. Okay. No good evidence that uh, uh, paying people for a, a job uh, makes them less excited about uh, uh, their job, and often they are more uh, excited. And you know, some studies uh, find that it, it might, you might initially uh, um, you know, uh, reduce your effort; you were just getting paid, and so you think, "Okay, I achieved my goal. I can relax my effort. I don't need to continue working uh, uh, so hard." But then, after a while, you uh, get the motivation back, and, and payment uh, doesn't uh, really decrease motivation in general, and, and not uh, intrinsic motivation, unless. By getting paid, you are not really sure why you do that anymore. And so incentives can mess up our understanding of why we do the, the thing that we do. Okay? Like the classic uh, studies by, by Leper, like if you pay, if you give rewards to kids for drawing, they might ask themselves, do I even like drawing? Maybe I was just doing it in order to get this nice certificate with uh, the ribbon. I, you know, we, we told kids that, food can make them strong or, or smart and they stopped eating that food because they they were unsure that they liked the food given that they thought mm-hmm. about these uh, incentives. Uh, but, you know, put that aside, if we understand why we do something, if we are excited about what we do, then often uh, 
getting the, the reward, getting the monetary reward or any other uh, reward is, uh, uh, is something that helps us uh, maintain the motivation is uh, often the immediate goal. Okay, in the long term, I might want to be a professional, uh, a successful professional in, in the short term. I'm going to uh, uh, give myself a reward for uh, uh, finish a project at work. And so I, I have some short-term uh, goals. Uh, when I write about incentives, I say that it's really important that you reward the right thing okay, so that you don't confuse yourself about why, why you do the thing you do and what should be measured. Okay, how should you evaluate your, your performance? Uh, don't worry about uh, uncertain incentives. They often work better than certain incentives and don't have too many incentives. Yeah, don't have too many. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so finding the right the right magic number is is difficult. But um, what do you what do you think of SMART goal? You know, the S M A R T. Is that a scientifically grounded framework? for reaching one's goals? Is it aligned with your research? Because I see it everywhere in positive psychology. Uh, it's, a, it's a popular acronym. Uh, I, uh, I will connect it back to Maslow, okay, like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's important to understand that there are many uh, ingredients and there are many factors that influence motivation. The idea that we can uh, make a list and only what's on the list counts and everything that's right. on the list counts is, you know, is, is a bit naive. Okay, like we uh, have a, like m many things that affect our uh, motivation. So th these are uh, you know, important factors. I just don't think that there is a single recipe for motivation. Sure, and that that's an excellent point. It just seems like some of these uh, think the parts of the SMART acronym map onto some things you've said already. So S is specific, uh, M is measurable. So you did talk about the measurable part. Um, A attainable, R relevant, and T time based. Um, but anyway, <laughs> there there's a, there's there's some overlap. Yeah, there. yeah. Well, there is no uh, intrinsic motivation there. That's true. That's actually very true. Yeah, uh, because it, add a, how where would you add the I to make it a nice acronym? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, so you know the, the nice thing about this acronym, which is very old, is that it mm -hmm. got people to understand that there was more than one thing. Okay, and mm -hmm. the, these acronyms, like, they emerged at uh, at the point in time where uh, we were trying as a field to educate people that there was more than one thing, there was more than one way to to motivate people. And and so people were saying there was more than one, one way, here there are five ways, okay? but there are also more than five ways. And, and there was really a lot of ways to think about how to, to motivate yeah. yourself and others. Well, the R relevant seems somewhat linked to intrinsic motivation your goals should align with your values and long-term objectives. Well, this is actually an interesting question. Can you have something that's very value-aligned, but you don't intrinsically enjoy doing it, but you kind of, you know, even you suffer doing it. Like a lot of people do a lot of things that, that are meaningful to them that they don't enjoy intrinsically, but they they want, they know it'll make the world a better place. Do you know what I mean? Well, many health goals are like that, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they are mm -hmm. uh, either uh, like that because we didn't find the the way to do it that is intrinsically uh, motivating. Okay, so you know someone might hate exercising because the the way that they try to exercise was uh, always only motivated by some long term benefits. They could not find any pleasure at the moment, and so at this point, it's not intrinsically uh, motivating. Then uh, some. Behavior, say some actions that we need to take in order to stay healthy are very much uh, extrinsically uh, uh, motivating. There are certain uh, uh, treatments, okay, if uh, uh, you know, someone has to uh, go uh, through uh, chemotherapy, uh, this is very extrinsically uh, uh, motivating. And uh, no, nevertheless, that has to be done. Yeah, yeah. Um, so something can be intrinsically motivating in the long term, but not the short term as well. Like there are certain things that 
we're don't we're not enjoying doing them, but we can still be intrinsically motivated to do them. So I would say, am I overcomplicating things? Yeah. So let's define intrinsic motivation as as doing something for the sake of doing it. Okay. So the 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 value yeah. is from doing. Okay. And in this sense, like exercising or, or getting a job, they they are rarely just intrinsically motivating. Okay? You are not just doing it for the sake of doing it. You are thinking about long term benefits. Uh, yeah. But you might love your your job or your uh, exercise uh, uh, routine. And in this sense, you're more intrinsically motivated than someone who is really only doing it in order to uh, uh, be healthy uh, uh, or uh, uh, pay the rent. Okay? And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. these individual differences really matter. Those that are intrinsically motivated that find the value in doing, not just in achieving what they will achieve by doing, uh, are much more likely to uh, persist on their goals. Thank you. Yeah, I see that in the field, I see intrinsic motivation defined differently by some researchers. Yeah. So I appreciate I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, I had Richard Ryan on my podcast, yeah. you know, uh, self-determination theory. Um, you would consider him a major player in motivation science field as well? Yes, right? yes. So uh, yes, so th- there are a few definitions of uh, intrinsic motivation, and I'm I, I'm mm-hmm. really happy that you uh, brought it up. Uh, first, uh, economists usually or sometimes talk about intrinsic motivation as anything that's not money. Okay, and so they really put the con the content that if you are being paid, you're extrinsically uh, motivated. If you are uh, not getting paid, you're intrinsically motivated. Uh, and by that definition, you could think about the person who undergoes uh, a chemotherapy as being intrinsically motivated because they they want it, okay? They, they are not getting paid. Uh, psychologists don't really use that definition. Uh, we use that, uh, the definition of doing something for the sake of doing it, like getting the value from doing it. Now, what uh, uh, Ryan and and Desi did in in their work on intrinsic motivation is trying to understand what is the content that is most likely to be intrinsically uh, motivating. What are the the kind of goals that people pursue usually for the sake of pursuing and not for the, the sake of achieving? What are the, what they call internal uh, motives? And this is really important work. Uh, what my work uh, was doing is looking more at the structure, okay, and, and putting aside the content, seeing that if people feel that doing is right for them, that doing feels good, uh, they will be more intrinsically uh, motivated regardless of the, the content of their motivation. So the feeling is a real big part of this. You know, how it feels when you're engaging in the activity. Yeah. Is that right? You know, um, something uh, that Angela, because uh, my office used to be right next door to Angela's at Penn, and we used to discuss flow and, and its relationship to to deliberate practice, because sometimes they're kind of opposites in some ways, um, at least the feeling experientially of putting in the effort of deliberate practice versus experientially the feeling of flow. And then some, you know, some people in the field say that the flow feeling is, is kind of a neutral feeling. You, you don't feel positive or negative because you're just not focused on, you're, all, you're, you're so absorbed in the activity that it doesn't feel anything. Um, yeah, Chick sent me. I had sent that. Had said that. Uh, I believe at some point. So I think it's just interesting that you can have other states that are more like neutral when you're engaging them, but are really meaningful to you. You're really so enraptured uh, with what you're doing. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And you know, sometimes uh, the feeling might not be just like fun and pleasant, and still you feel very mm. good about what uh, what you do. Uh, we recently published a, a paper that we uh, that, that tells the story of, of a study that we ran with people who were uh, studying uh, improvisation, and this is with the Second City uh, Improvisation Club here in Chicago. And yeah. you know, they, these are not professional people. Okay, these are not people who are uh, who know how to act and, and plan to have a career. This is like people like me who just want to boost their confidence through improvisation. And so when they start taking these classes, they tend to not like their experience very much. They feel embarrassed. Okay? Like it, mm-hmm. it feels odd, like you're asked to do something with your body and like get attention on you and you, you just like 
not, not quite in your comfort zone. And what we did was asking people to feel uncomfortable. Okay, and so we told them your goal is to feel uncomfortable, and uh, they were more engaged, and they have more likely to to tell us that they will come back, that they they want to do it, and uh, and in a way that like having this goal to feel uncomfortable really works for them. Now, what's going on there is that, well, I know how to feel uncomfortable, and when I get myself there, when I feel uncomfortable, then I feel like I've achieved my goal. <laughs> I feel like this is working. Okay, this is right. So, like we capture like this feels right by having people embrace the the discomfort that you will feel in the short run when you're just starting uh, learning import. I love that. Um, I I'm doing some work with Second City as well. Um, oh. Is this uh, Kelly Leonard yeah. and uh, Anne Libera? Yeah, what yeah. are you doing with them? Yeah. Creating a coat. Well, it's top secret. <laughs> we haven't we haven't unraveled to the general public yet. But uh, yeah, but they're, I can say they're dear friends of mine, and I they have actually told me that they're doing some work with you, and they're very excited about working with you. Oh gosh, we, so we now, now, I, now I remember. We really have yeah. the same friends. How come we've never met? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's why. That's why at the beginning I was like, "Wow, it's so nice to finally meet you." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I'm. That, that's that's so great to hear that you're doing you're doing work with them on that. They're they're awesome. They are totally. Um, and that and that's really yeah, and that's really important. That's really important work. Uh, okay, so let's let's like move on in our ingredients. Um, even though you said they're not rules, you know, they're just ingredients. Yeah. Um, the second is you need to sustain your motivation, um, right? Um, why is it important to solicit feedback on your performance in, during this this kind of stage? Well, it's it's really hard to uh, to learn without progress. It's la- sorry, it's really hard to learn without feedback. So you don't know where you mm-hmm. stand. You don't know whether you are doing it well or you are not doing it well. Uh, it's really hard to sustain your motivation when you don't know that you are making progress okay when you uh, cannot mm-hmm. look back or, or look ahead and, uh, and and say yeah like i i'm getting uh, uh, somewhere okay and uh, often in order to perceive progress you need to either look back or look forward so you know uh, sometimes the, the target is moving okay or it's really far away but you can look back and say well i already did something okay i already I, I took my first uh, uh, class or uh, you know i wrote uh, uh, the first page in the book that i'm i'm planning to to write uh, mm. th- that helps people maintain their motivation and we we found for example that when students were unsure whether they should study for an exam uh, looking back at the materials that they've already covered it helped them stay motivated when people were not sure whether they should support a cause uh, they can, in charitable giving, looking at how much was already done, uh, how much they contributed or how much others contributed, motivate them to to keep giving, to keep helping uh, the, uh, the cause. Uh, other times when you're almost, uh, well, let's say when you're beyond the 50% and you're getting closer to your target, then it's actually better to to look ahead and to look at the discrepancy and this is where the discrepancy theories in psychology suggest that when you you look where it where you want to be and how far you are from there that that will motivate you you will monitor your progress toward that point yeah um that even goes back to uh one of my mentors in in, as an undergraduate herb simon's work Mm -hmm. right on uh, means and analysis and all that nerdy stuff from from that time period of the 50s, 60s, Simon and Newell, right? Yeah, yeah. There is a, uh, yeah, there is like the, uh, you know, the, the uh, TOT uh, uh, model, the test operate, test exit, mm-hmm. which is uh, uh, like yeah. an wow. old idea. You know that. Uh, an old idea that suggests that you monitor your progress always looking forward. Okay, you're looking at the target, you see, how, am I getting there okay am i close enough if i'm close enough and maybe i can relax my efforts if i'm far i should increase my effort uh, that only works for people who are already committed okay? uh, if you are yeah. uncommitted if you're very far from your target and looking at the discrepancy uh, tends to destroy commitment yeah that's a good point um you talk about avoiding the importance of avoiding the middle problem 
What is the middle problem? <laughs> yeah, so you you start something, you are fully uh, motivated, you're excited, you just decided to do that thing. Okay? Uh, when you're about to reach your target or your goal, then again, there is excitement. There usually this increase in uh, effort, in particular if it's this uh, all or nothing uh, goal. Uh, in the middle, we don't have parties. Okay? In the middle, uh, uh, we... we it's not uh, uh, something that we in particular pay attention to. And this is where we, we see uh, uh, motivation uh, not quite <laughs> not quite where we want it to be. And, and we see that the decline in motivation both on like how hard people work and on how much they, they adhere to their personal standards, okay? how much they are willing to mm. cut corners, to just like, you know, cheat a little bit maybe. Uh, in a way, people behave as if they are aware that they will not remember what they did in the middle, so they don't need to pay attention to be too careful about doing it right. To give you a couple of examples, we looked at uh, uh, people in uh, Israel lighting the menorah over the eight days of Hanukkah, so they are supposed to light the menorah on every day, day, between day one and day eight, and most people light the menorah on the first day, and uh, many people the majority actually lights the menorah on the last day, but in the middle, it's when uh, people are slacking. Uh, we did a study. Yeah, uh, they, we, we did studies in which people actually had to they, do something, do a task for like several trials, and in the middle, they were not doing such a great job. Yeah, I think a lot of people will resonate with that when they listen to this podcast. I mean, I know I certainly resonate with that. Okay, I know avoid the middle problem, but how can you overcome it? Do you have any strategies or tips for that? Keeping middle short, uh, mm. you know, instead of uh, an annual uh, saving goal, make it a monthly uh, saving goal. Instead of a monthly uh, exercising goal, uh, make it a weekly exercising goal so that we just uh, less of, uh, of a middle Okay, the, the problem with the New Year's resolutions, for example, is that this goal is for a year, so you know it, it's it's really a hard to maintain the motivation as as you like moving mm -hmm. from like March to April. Uh, and, and another solution is uh, uh, to uh, find new beginnings. Okay, the, um, you know, my, my colleague uh, Katie Milkman came up with a fresh start effect, uh, which basically chooses some kind of random date to announce uh, that it's uh, it's the first day. Okay? It's, it's, it's the first day of pursuing this goal because it's a Monday, okay? or because it's my birthday, or because it's the first day of the month. Like, and any, any reason that you can find in order to restart the count okay, helps people like, recruit their motivation, motivation. Think about it as, as a beginning. Good, good. And uh, yeah, Katie's wonderful. She was on this podcast when her book came out, and I'm so glad that you're you're working with her. Yeah, yeah. She's part of the Angela uh, team, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's it's the whole team over there at Penn. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're killing it. <laughs> they're killing. It. They're crushing cr crushing it. They're getting it done. They're getting it done. Right. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they 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 walk the talk. Okay. So the third um, ingredient is learning how to juggle multiple goals. I think. That for a lot of people, this might be the hardest one for them, because there's lots of things pulling us in different directions. How can we um, set priorities and find the right balance here? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, uh, it, it, we always want several things, guys. Okay? So we uh, we have a to do list for every day in our minds, okay? and they are often conflicting uh, uh, goals and. Sometimes we want to choose between these goals. Okay, sometimes we we really want to set priorities. Okay, I might prioritize uh, my, my health goal over my uh, uh, desire to uh, eat junk food. Okay, uh, other times it's really a matter of balancing of, of making trade-offs. Okay, and so I you know I, I might want to uh, uh, eat organic food, but I also don't want to spend too much money and. Like usually, organic food is, is expensive. Uh, I need to balance mm. between these goals. Okay? I need to decide how much I'm going to expand on uh, organic food. Uh, or, you know, the, the ultimate balancing is is career and, and family. You know, most well, uh, 
I actually don't have the numbers, but many people uh, choose to balance between career and family. Of course, some people decide that they're going to postpone having a family so they can focus on their career uh, or that they will resign their career because they want to uh, prioritize the family. But you know, for many of us, it, it's a matter of balancing. And you know, to the extent that people are, are making like, these trade-offs, then we can look at what activities they, they choose and in general, people prefer activities that maximize attainment, okay? yeah, uh, these, these mm-hmm. activities that help them achieve more than one goal. So exercise mm-hmm. in a way that uh, uh, maybe is also my commute to work. It's also a way to spend time with uh, uh, a friend. Uh, um, uh, maybe it's also not an expensive way of exercising, so I can also meet uh, uh, that uh, goal. The problem with these activities, we call them multifinal uh, means, is that because they serve different goals, they sometimes seem less efficient, less instrumental for any of these goals in a way. (laughs) Sometimes people feel that a commute to work is not as good exercise as an exercise that is just an exercise, okay, that doesn't also uh, get you another thing. And there there are actually funny examples with that, like people prefer a mouthwash that stings because, you know, if it's pleasant, they assume that it's not very good at... Uh, it's at not working. Else. Yes, <laughs> right? Like, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is a mistake, but it these kind of mistakes, when people choose means that only serve one goal, teach us about how, how people's goal systems work, like how people infer instrumentality based on the number of things that they can achieve uh, by pursuing an activity. Does this make sense? Mm. Maybe I was a bit too academic. (laughs) No, 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 it it absolutely, it absolutely doesn't make sense. Um, I think that a big part of this is having patience and, um, and, and building your self-control muscle, right? And I, that's hard. I mean, do you have any tips for people on how they can build those muscles? Uh, well, the, the first thing is to remember that this is a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. You, we often use metaphors in order to yeah. uh, to help people understand what we are talking about, in order to help people understand that self-control takes practice, basically, right? This is why we refer to it as a muscle. But then people take this metaphor too far and, uh, and, and you know, coming up with all kinds of physiological explanation for self-control, which are really uh, not... Uh, not like Roy really Baumeister's work? Uh, yeah, like Roy Baumeister. Roy Baumeister, like the, the, what, this is the work on a, a ego depletion, which uh, suggests that uh, yeah. after people... Uh, exercise self-control, they they get tired, okay, they you know they, they feel that they need to replenish their uh, resources. And like a lot of this is is true, but then like again like using the muscles metaphor prevent you from understanding that a lot of it is uh, is the mental fatigue, okay, is that you're tired of doing it, okay, that it, it's, uh, you, you cannot resist certain temptations for a really long time because you feel fed up with that, okay? It's not that you actually got tired, okay? It's just that I can resist cookies for a certain amount of time. At one point, I will just say whatever, like, you know, like, give me a break here. I deserve yeah, yeah, yeah. that cookie. Right now. Uh, so, uh, but going back to the uh, tips for how to uh, uh, better exercise self-control, I would say that a lot of the problem with self-control is uh, in identifying temptation. And it, mm. we need to first see that there is a problem before we battle it. So we first need to identify the temptation and then battle it. And the reason that mm. it's not trivial is that many of the temptations, our everyday temptations, will not hurt us if we do it, do it just, just once. Okay? If I uh, yell at my partner uh, just once or leave a mess uh, uh, mess in, in, in the bathroom, like now nothing happens. Okay? Like it's it's okay. Like, you know, he knows me uh, long enough, he will forgive me. Okay, It's really about mm-hmm. being obnoxious to the f- people around you too many mm-hmm. times that makes it inappropriate that like that you really need to control your your negative emotions or you know eating one cookie will not destroy your diet drinking 
you know, one glass of uh, alcohol uh, might actually make you more pleasant at the party. It's drinking the, the seventh uh, uh, glass that uh, will make you uh, very unpleasant. And like the, the trick is really to understand when a temptation is, is a temptation. Uh, one way that I write about is uh, uh, using broad decision frames, thinking about doing that several times or so all the time. And like there are some really nice studies that show that if you just get people to think about making this decision several times, they are going to exercise more self-control. So you know, if you get people to think about the number of times that they will uh, buy uh, champagne this year, Okay? And they realize mm. that it's not just for today's party. It's actually something that I do several times a year. Then they are uh, paying more attention to how much money they are spending on, on the champagne bottle. Mm. Well, any other research studies along those lines as well? Because I actually really enjoy hearing about <laughs> your, the studies you've conducted uh, on this topic. Yeah. This also gives our listeners a kind of a window into, uh, into scientific research. So I will mention another yeah. study that we ran with helping people identify temptations. Uh, we asked them about a bunch of uh, ambiguously unethical things that you can do at the workplace, okay, such as uh, mm. taking office supply home or uh, uh, calling sick when you really uh, uh, just don't feel like going to work, uh, using your uh, uh, traveling uh, uh, budget uh, uh, for uh, buying a meal for you and a friend uh, and so on. And for these kind of behaviors, when people consider doing it just once, they say, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I can see myself doing it. Uh, when you ask them whether they are going to do it multiple times, then they say no. Okay, So in a way, mm -hmm. by using this poor decision frame, you get people to say, no, I will not going to take office supply home if I think about all the times in which uh, I'm, I can do this. Uh, then we did some other studies on what people do once they identify a temptation. And it turned out mm. that if people anticipate temptations, if they know that they are coming, they are better able to resist. It, it's a bit like, if I tell you that my uh, desk is very heavy and can you help me lift it, you're going to approach it with more force than if I tell you this desk is very light, can you help me get it to another corner of the room? Okay, like knowing that, the temptation is there, makes people prepare to it and, and better able to resist it. So you know, in, in our studies, uh, knowing that uh, a medical checkup is going to be unpleasant or that the exercise mm. is going to be hard, uh, the studying is going to be difficult, uh, led people to plan to invest more effort uh, and more time in uh, these activities. I'm really glad I asked you to mention another study because I love that study that you just mentioned. So thank you, Dr. Fischbach. Um, that's wonderful. It, it it kind of speaks to the value of of mindful awareness. I mean, I, that links to uh, Ellen Langer's work. I would I would say right to a certain degree. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Also, you know, the the study that we discussed with uh, Second City, I think, uh, speaks to how well uh, that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in front, the more I, I hang out with those guys, you know, like <laughs> Kelly and Ann, I realize that uh, if you treat life like improv, you know, you you have a much more enjoyable life. And also, you make more friends because you can yes and everyone. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I really, what I took uh, from like working with them is, is really that. Uh, getting more yeah. comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. I think that improvisation yeah. is such a good experience that uh, um, feeling uncomfortable and being okay with that, and, you know, experimenting with it. Yeah. I completely agree, yeah. The idea of staying positive, right? Because like in positive psychology, there's a lot of focus on optimism as yeah. such a strong predictor of lots of things. Um, in your book, you talk about how to know if and when a glass half full or half empty perspective will motivate you. So I want to kind of link that to some of these ideas about optimism and, you know? Yeah, it's interesting because I don't really think about the glass half empty as uh, as, as being a, a pessimist. Pessimism. Yeah. It's, okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, hey, fair enough. <laughs> and actually, I say <laughs> it in enough. the book. Like, you know, I, I know that these words are usually meant like, yeah, yeah. optimist versus the pessimist. 
the discrepancy uh, uh, theories look at people getting motivated by what they have not done. Now, it's not, it's not that they are upset about the things that they have not done. It's just that they look at, at what they have yet to achieve. Okay, like we, no, we did a study with uh, employees in an advertising uh, company, and that was in Seoul, in uh, South Korea. And we asked some of them to uh, look back at what they achieved last year and the others to uh, think about what they haven't yet achieved. Mm. And so no, no one is really upset or in particular happy about this exercise, but they either have in their mind the glass half full, everything that they achieve, or half empty, like the thing that they have not yet achieved. And they can still work on it, but it hasn't happened yet. And, and what we found is that those who looked back like their current world more. They were more enthusiastic about what they, they did. They wanted to, to do that more. But those that were looking ahead had what we refer to as higher level of aspiration. They wanted to move to their next world. And so you you get those like high achieving people. They they always look forward, okay? They always look at the, at the glass half empty, not in the negative sense, but in, in the sense of like, this could be my next step. That could be my next challenge. That is the next mountain that I want to, uh, to climb on. The, their mind is on, on the on the things that they have not yet uh, uh, achieved. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. But you don't want also don't want to get a, you know the fear of missing out. You know, um, yeah. I yeah that, that you can get too focused on that right and be like and 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 not find the meaning and extract the joy in the moment of what you're currently accomplished accomplishing right. It, yeah. Yes, and so you 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 can choose to look at what you have achieved versus what you you still want to achieve and cool. like. I think that you're pointing out something very important, that if you're always future-oriented, you never get to celebrate your achievement, right? Like you're, you're never yeah. quite where you want to be. Like you're always working toward something that will happen always. in the future. I, and I also talk about learning from negative feedback, and I, and I, I think yeah. that there is a lot of... Uh, uh, negative feedback around us that if we can extract useful lessons from, then we can improve. We can do things better. But it's not easy. Well, it's not easy. And but in your book, you actually go through um, and help people with some suggestions on how to. Uh, to stay on track when faced with negative feedback. Uh, that was one of my favorite. I'm, I'm going to be serious. That's one of my favorite chapters in your whole book or sections, sections in your book, yeah. you know? Um, like, so talk, can you talk a little about that? You know, like what is a, a you know, a, what is a learning mindset for instance, you know, and, sing, and distancing yeah. and yeah. Talk about some of yeah, that. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, there, there is yeah. a lot of research in motivation science on how to learn from negative feedback. And the reason is that we are not very good at it, okay? So people are not very good at it. And as I say, that also animals are not very good at it. Like, it's really hard to learn from negative feedback. It's easy to pay attention to the negative feedback. Like, it's it's easy to say, uh, uh, oops, I messed it up. But the, the lessons, okay, so if not this, then what should you do? Uh, that's uh, not trivial. It's not trivial because it requires... Thinking in terms of elimination, okay, like eliminated one way, then what are the ways that I could try? It also just hard emotionally because you might be too uh, uh, upset about the, the negative feedback. But we developed some ways, okay, and uh, uh, one uh, way is a uh, Carol Dweck's uh, a growth mindset, okay, thinking about negative feedback in terms of learning so you know asking yourself or asking people around you what have you learned okay what mm. is a better way to do that given the feedback that you uh, just uh, uh, received and, and people that are learning from failure are improving okay uh, another uh, way uh, is distance yourself uh, we find that it's much easier to learn from other people's failures okay and so we we use really simple tasks. Like you are, you are asked to guess the answer to some question. Like I, like I, I don't know. Like giving you pictures of two uh, uh, couples, and we ask you which one is a real couple, which one is just two people that we put their pictures next to each other, and you guess it, and we either tell you that you were successful or not. After five minutes, we learn what have you learned. Do you still remember which couple is the right couple? Turn out that when people get negative feedback for themselves. 
they don't learn very well, but when they watch another person making the wrong guess, they learn, okay? They are better able to learn from another person's mistakes. So distance yourself. Uh, Ethan Course's work on uh, self-talk comes right. to mind. I uh, love that stuff. Yeah. love that. All yeah. right. So, so he says that one way to distance yourself is to like, refer to yourself with your name, okay? So like for me, it would be uh, I, I yell at what happened. I yell at can, like, what should you do in this situation and you know, kind of like look at myself as if I'm looking at, at another person, if I'm looking at you, Scott, messing up, okay, and what I would learn from you. Yeah. Uh, and I would mention one more thing that we uh, uh, developed, which is uh, uh, giving advice to another person. Uh, and uh, uh, this is actually a paper with uh, uh, Lauren S. Chris uh, Winkler and uh, Angela Duckworth. Oh, Lauren. Hi. She's great. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, we wish you Lauren was my postdoc. So she's uh, uh, close Wonderful. to my heart. And, uh, and, and so Lauren came up with the idea that uh, how about we uh, ask people to give advice? So we'll, we'll ask people who are struggling with school, like kids, to give advice to other people kids who struggle in school or people that mm -hmm. are uh, overweight to give other people advice on how to lose weight or people that are unemployed to give other people advice on how to get a job. And tell now that if you give advice to another person that really requires you to think about what you have learned and so you are learning. But it seems to me that's also related to like Chris and Neff's self-compassion work as well, right? Like how can we integrate the self, like the self, the like having self compassion about about it, as well as giving advice. I think there's a nice integration. There's a paper there. If Kristen wa <laughs> they never wanted to yeah. be involved, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Actually, you know, like in in our yeah. work on advice, that really the effect was on on the person who gave the advice. So you gave the advice, and now you feel uh, more uh, motivated. And we didn't go to the next step of like what your mm -hmm. advice is actually doing to the person who received it. Um, yeah. Many times it was just an, a mental exercise of what your advice would be. Okay, we we didn't actually give it to anybody. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree. But it's probably having an effect. Yeah, yeah it's probably having. Yeah. Effect. Okay, I'll call Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Call Lauren yeah. and uh, I'll That's make like, the intro to Kristen, um, Kristen F. Yeah. You know, because she's doing great work. Okay, uh, let's let's talk about the value of social support. I uh, really love this part of your book as well. Why is it? Uh, what what is important to think about when you're pursuing goals in the presence of others? What what should you um, think through? It. Yeah. yeah. Well, so many of the goals that we pursue are with others. Okay, actually, the most important goals in our lives are often things that we do with other people, okay, whether it's uh, um, you know, in, at work or starting a family or the, like in your community, okay, you're, you're doing things with other people. And so working with other people is critical because with your two hands and one mind, you, you cannot do enough. Uh, and other times it's in uh, the context of personal goals and doing something without social support is extremely hard. Uh, often if you don't have social support, that is if the people around you are not on board with your goal, that the first thing that you should do is find those people who support you, okay? Find that that mentor, okay? That person that... Uh, uh, agrees that what you're doing is is worth doing and and is going to to support you and be, and be your role model maybe uh, but mainly yeah. uh, as someone that contains your your goal uh, for you. So I, I talk about these two aspects: like how to do things with others and how to uh, make sure that we connect to the people that support our goals. Hmm. Yeah, and you argue that goals make a happy relationship. Yeah. So what is that? What is that connection there? Uh, yeah. So we are drawn toward people who are, uh, who support our goals, and uh, uh, we are uh, no, we just completed a series of studies uh, where we uh, ask people uh, how much uh, they know someone, like a friend or a partner, okay? and uh, uh, how much they feel that that person knows them. And mm -hmm. then the third question is, how satisfied are you with the relationship? And when we have mm -hmm. these three questions, we can see what uh, uh, 
better predicts relationship satisfaction. And this is really relationship with anyone, okay, with a friend, with a colleague, uh, uh, with uh, a spouse. Uh, it is mainly predicted by how much you feel that they know you. Okay, and so you, we are drawn uh, to, to be closer to the people who we feel know us and, and can therefore support our goals. Okay, the person that knows what I'm trying to mm-hmm. achieve uh, in my life uh, is, uh, is the person that I want to be in a relationship with. Now, of course, you no know, relationship has more than one person in it. So to the extent that I know their goals and can support theirs, then I want to be with them to the extent that uh, they, 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 sorry, I, I didn't say it quietly. To the extent that they know me, I want to be with them to the extent that uh, uh, I know them, they want to be with me. Okay. Hopefully I did not uh, uh, confuse you with that sentence. But basically- The extent to which you know them, can that also increase the chances that you want to be with them? <laughs> Not not just that they want to be with you. It's, well, so for each side, it is more critical to feel that you are known. Feel seen. Yes, to feel that, <laughs> feel yeah. seen, and that's selfish. Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> no, no, I get it. I get it. Um, look, you know, I think this relates a little bit to Eli Finkel's work. Yes. Um, Eli Finkel, yeah, cool. I'm so glad that you agree with that because <laughs> I went out on a limb uh, connecting it to his work. But um, I like to, in you know, all these podcasts, kind of try to see make linkages when I can to other researchers in the field. And I really like how he um, has this kind of self actualization model of relationships. And he he brings in my my favorite uh, psychologist Maslow um, in talking about uh, you know you want to feel it like both partners are helping each other grow and. That seems very much related to what you're saying. Yes, exactly. And uh, Eli's work is mainly in the context of romantic relationships. That's um, right. That's right. Uh, yeah. We often look also at other relationships and, and see a similar pattern where uh, you want to be with, with a colleague or, or a boss or, uh, you know, uh, and anyone in your life, a friend uh, that uh, uh, understands your, your goals, that uh, supports you. Yeah, yeah. You say, um, uh, quote, ultimately what matters is that a relationship helps rather than hurts your goals. In this way, helping each other pursue our goals is fundamental to social connection. And I just want to end this interview today on that note because, um, you know, during COVID, and you do link it, you have a paragraph there, right, about COVID um, there at the end of your book. Um, you know, a lot of people are feeling really lonely right now, right? And really, uh, and, and you know, like Cacioppo's work, et cetera, has shown uh, the real health um, you know, really could be detrimental to our biology and our health uh, when we're feeling lonely. So, you know, just kind of ending on this note, kind of giving people a little bit of hope and how we can restore more relationships, feel less lonely using some of this goal research, I think is very valuable. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, John Cassiopo's uh, uh, work on, uh, on social connection and how critical it is for physical health, okay, uh, is, is the first to, uh, to come to mind. Um we are very concerned with that loneliness. Uh, uh, surveys suggest that people nowadays are lonelier than before. And this is data before COVID. Okay, the, This is just like the, the yeah. modern lifestyle where just people have more personal space. And the, the negative uh, aspect of that is that they just uh, spend more uh, time alone uh, or that older uh, people can end up uh, spending a lot of time uh, by themselves. Uh this this is unhealthy. Okay? Like this is uh, uh, killing uh, uh, people, and in the context of COVID, that's a, a major concern when we are trying to 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 think about how to uh, maintain a healthy uh, lifestyle. This is definitely part of what we think of, in, in particular for like kids and for uh, older uh, people, how to make sure that social connection is is uh, part of their daily lives. Huge, huge. Um, yes, your book is timely in in a lot of ways, um, and will always be timely for the rest of the Homo sapiens that want to get things done. Homo sapiens will always want to be know how they can be better motivated. So your research is uh, is pretty relevant to humanity. Um, Dr. Fishbach, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for coming on my podcast today, and um, it was a true honor and pleasure for me. And uh, I wish you well with uh, with continuing your research. 
and the book. Yeah, thank you. Congrats, congrats on the book. Th- thank you very much. It, uh, it feels good and really love talking to you about it. Uh, uh, you know, maybe we'll meet in person one day. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that'll be very nice. That'll be very nice. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.